Okay, 9.02, and this is the what, May 13th uh, waste site cleanup office hours. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, so not, not a lot of updates and stuff today. Uh, we can go through the laundry list of, of updates, but uh, we'll start with the uh, the one graphic that I have for everybody. So, um, you know, might as well make, do this consistently. Uh, you should be seeing the PFAS private well sampling program update uh, up to 95 results received. And for my interests are the ones 20 to 90 parts per trillion or greater, anything greater than 20 actually. And uh, we have an, another hit there. So, uh, we're up to four, four out of 95, around 4%, uh, everything else. Uh, so, you know, 96% less than 20 parts per trillion, uh, about 90% are less than 10, uh, and 60% non-detects, which is running a little bit, uh, a little bit lower than I was hoping for, but, you know, we'll see how that goes again. A hundred is, is still pretty small number uh, compared to what we hope to be getting in the future. Um, there are another almost 300 ready to sample. So, you know, the logistics are playing out and um, almost 200 with uh, results that are pending. So this sh should be picking up, the pace should be picking up with the results. Um, so that's, that's the PFAS news of the week. Uh, the COVID news of the week, we have no changes on kind of our status, you know, here in Wayside Cleanup or DEP. Um, the last that we heard from our executive office on kind of when we're going back and all that was to, you know, the, our current status goes through uh, the beginning of June. So we're uh, eagerly anticipating some uh, more update in the near future, which is probably going to be something, you know, along the lines of, you know, we're still working from home, but that, you know, there may be some changes in the future. Um, you know, everybody has probably been hearing the governor talk about August 1st as certainly a date where there are a lot more changes are, are being made. And for the first time the other day, I was listening to the radio and, and heard talk of rescinding executive orders and the state of emergency. Uh, so it, you know, Obviously, no, you know, you're not hearing any details. We're not hearing any more details than that, but it does look good for some kind of return to normal and things will be probably changing, you know, uh, gradually over the summer. Uh, and my bet in the, the office pool is still the beginning of September for kind of a, a more of actually more frequent, more routine going back into the office, but the rumors that we, we certainly have been hearing is that there will be some sort of flexibility and uh, a lot more um, teleworking op opportunities than had existed pre-pandemic, so that, you know, there will be something good coming out of all of this. But otherwise, uh, no news, no news from that. Um, well, IT bought all those laptops, right? IT bought all the laptops, and we all have laptops now, um, and and we're all still learning how to use them, more or less. Uh, you know, uh, everybody is uh, you know, trying them out and and working with them, and you know, for the most part, it's working well. It's just you know, you you do hear the occasional you know odd glitches happening, and we're following up on one odd email glitch this week uh, that. You know, would happen even if you were using desktops and stuff like that. You're, there are always odd IT glitches. It's just a lot harder to deal with when you're doing it remotely. Um, and you don't know, you can't, you know, yell across the cubicles and say, you know, is everybody else see, getting the same problem, seeing the same problems I'm having? Uh, so you feel like you might be, you don't know whether you're, you're doing something wrong or there's something wrong with your particular machine, or it's just one of the, you know, system-wide glitches that, that happen. Um, so, what type of laptops did the state buy for everybody? Uh, what type do they buy? Um, no, I should have mine around. Hewlett Packard. 
Oh, you can't see mine. Uh, there it is. Hewlett there Packard. Is. Yeah. Um, you notice that the newer laptops have fewer and fewer connections to them. <laughs> oh, but, but, no CD drives anymore. <laughs> That, that's true. I was at a DVD I, drive. I, I was in the office uh, on Tuesday and uh, doing mail. And one of the things that one the type of mail that we get is a report coming in um, and your know, big, thick report. They send us the printed version. I, uh, if they're really good, they include a, a CD or DVD in the back uh, containing the electronic version of it. And these are yeah, the type of reports we get in the Boston office are coming from, are, are with the federal facilities or you know, super fun sites. Uh, so DOD, in this case, the Navy, you know, sent the report with a CD in the back and I went to, to copy it uh, and, and send it off to the, the site manager. And I was, I brought in my laptop and was using that rather than my desktop because my desktop there is, is really slow uh, because it's old. And and that's when I realized that oh yeah there's no CD uh, on this and I have to I have to fire up the desktop and, and use that uh, so yeah they you but you can get those peripherals and somewhere around here I do have for my home laptop a a external DVD drive so you know, you just buy all these little pieces that you 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 plug in so yeah and they did give us uh, docking stations so. You know, there are at least holes that you can plug these things into uh, should you need to get them. Uh, but but that that's interesting. I have to ask around to see whether you know the staff has been running into problems not having a DVD or CD drive and what we can do about that. Um, but the Mossberg grants still haven't been announced yet. Uh, we're waiting for word on those. They're ready to go. Our technical assistance grants are ready to, I think they are, are they being posted this week, uh, Nancy or Liz? I'm losing track of what the day is. That's next week, right? When they, um, they are being posted on, oh, I'm sorry, Nancy, didn't see that's you. That's okay, it's May 19th. May 19th, yep, so next, that's next week. May 19th, that will start, uh, and with the, the, Kind of application period going into mid July, uh, so we'll do more more on that or links to that. Uh, you just Google technical assistance grants or tag and mass DP, and that should get you there. Um, and I I think that's it for kind of news, kind of all routine stuff. So open it up for you guys. What are your burning questions, concerns? Uh, it's a question for Liz, and I guess without asking for when the uh, revised MCP will come out, but it relates to the the AUL guidance. Um, we continue to have a lot of discussions internally about what's the guidance recommend, the existing guidance recommending how that apply. Do you have a sense as to is the AUL guidance going to be six months after the MCP or is it like ready to go along with the revised MCP or haven't started it yet? Or... Um, <laughs> well, we have started it. Um, there are a lot of draft changes already developed. Um, so I would like to have it available very soon or close to the effective date of oh, the good. changes of the RETS. And in terms of my my guidance priorities, the AUL guidance and the anthropogenic background historic fill are the, the ones I would like to finalize first. Along with the risk characterization guidance, which uh, is also, uh, I have not been directly involved in with yet. Um, that's what ORS is developing at this point. Is the anthropogenic fill guidance being updated just to follow the new MCP or it wasn't the way that was being worked on? There, there weren't, there weren't, a, um, there might have been some minor uh, wording changes to one of the many, um, you know, the layered definitions of anthropogenic background and historic fill, uh, but it's not so much changes related to the MCP, just that that 
has been out there as draft. Um, so okay. be just interested in, in making that final. I, I, Ken would probably want to chime in too. Um, if I, I don't know if we have any immediate plans to update the NAPL guidance, but we did make that change related to um, when an activity and use limitation is required. So yeah. if there's a change there. Um, that would be another one. Uh, and then uh, Liz, what are the thoughts about uh, Q and A's related to the, the new regs? Paul, we lost your audio. Uh oh, lost you all together. Uh, now, can you hear me, or are you all just choppy? Okay, I'll let you guys talk. My connection is unstable. Uh oh. He's going to have to break out the ham radio. <laughs> okay, so I guess we've moved on from more ways. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is somehow related to the MCP Q&As, I guess. Uh, uh, you can go back to uh, questions about guidance development, but we had moved on to birds. Yeah, well. <laughs> it's that time of year. In your absence, we're trying to fill the empty space. Yeah, I saw I saw a scarlet ten tanager. Oh, really? Yeah, the, the other day. Awesome. Which, yeah, I, I know nothing about birds. You know, take pictures of it and then go back and Google. What did I just see? They're, they're pretty. But I only saw one once. I was in high school, and I still have vivid recollections of seeing that bird. Ah. So. Well, this was out at the Aspect River National Wildlife Refuge. Yeah. Lovely. We have lots of turkeys around my house. And yesterday morning, one was sitting on the roof of my neighbor's car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Matt Hackman has started sharing my his favorite screen. Charles Adams cartoon. One of my favorites. There are many. What's so amazing about it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's cute. Okay. So, and any other questions about guidance? <laughs> or any other ways I clean up topic? No, any, any interesting? I have a question about the AUL guidance is one of the things that we've run into um, that was a, a change, sort of a change from the last round of guidance to the draft guidance. By the US military. So a, it's Westover Air Reserve Base, and we were putting an AUL on a portion of the base. And so we didn't know really who should sign. Was I, was I sending this to Donald Trump for a signature? Was it going to be like the military, like top military person? Like who was gonna be in charge of that? So I'm just wondering if there's gonna be a little bit more guidance on you know, other types of properties like federal properties. And also um, if there might be a way to provide like a template for when we're doing corp corporate filings, um, you know, because the, we get kind of a, a random assortment of documents. Like there might be minutes from a meeting that shows the elections of the officers and it has to be redacted um, or, um, you know, like, is there the, the secretary of state filing? Do we provide that? Just like what documentation needs to be provided, um, to meet that requirement for the AUL filing so that, you know, right now it's kind of like, we're just throwing as much stuff in there as possible to make sure that we're covering all of our bases, but it would be good to have a little more guidance on that. Um, and also clarification, because I think one set of guidance indicates that the 
documentation didn't need to be included. And then the, gui the draft guidance says that it does need to be included. Uh, I can address that if you like, Liz. Oh, go ahead, Luke. Um, so thank you for that comment. Um, you broke up just, I'm, the, I, I, I'm Luke Rogers, I'm the Bureau attorney. So it's kind of a legally thing. So I thought I would jump in. Um, thank you for that comment. Um, and it's, it is something that we think about. Um, and I, I, you were breaking up just at the beginning, but I, I hear basically two questions there. You know, one is who signs on behalf of various entities, you know, whether it's the president or um, the person you know, that you're dealing with um, or somebody in between. And what kind of authority, a signature authority documentation do you provide? Um, as to the former, the uh, sort of maybe not very helpful, but I think true answer is that uh, in general for government entities, we don't know. Um, we, you know, it's up to that government entity to decide itself who has the authority to sign an NAE well, um, which is why we look for some kind of authority documentation to make a good case to us that in fact the right person is signing it. Um, there are well-established conventions for corporations, now for LLCs, for some of the more common corporate entities that are out there. As far as I can tell, um, those conventions are less well established for government entities. And so in the cases that I've been involved with, I've been having whether or not it's sufficient, um, which is probably neither very satisfactory for you guys nor for us since it's a kind of a case by case type of situation. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, so long as, you know, Liz and Paul are interested, I, I could certainly spend some time thinking about um, government entities in particular, for example, and, and think about whether in that guidance we a little bit, um, you know, some, something a little bit more helpful. If I can chime in, I've worked with a handful of boards of selectmen or select boards and other small town entities, and they don't have a lot of legal expertise on their side of the table. And so they often say, oh, we have to address this. And so I, I end up helping them craft a letter with my like, fingers crossed that we've checked all the boxes and crossed all the T's. So if, if the DEP's guidance could include something that was like typical town, town government structure would be super helpful, um, especially that like what should be in the letter of authority. So whether it's ask, if it's asking the whole select board to sign, that's clear, the whole select board can do that. But if it's asking a representative, so either the chair of the board of selectmen or the town administrator, it'd be great to have that as a, a structure that we can just say, hey, here's, here's the template. Here's how that letter should look. So I'd, I'd appreciate that. All right, thank you. No, I, I hear that. And um, we'll, we'll keep municipalities in mind as well, towns um, in particular. Thank you. I think towns would be the, the most common one uh, and easier to deal with than the, than the question of state or federal properties. So, and, Right. In and, our case, we ended up having um, the commander of the base sign on behalf of, you know, he's the commander of the base. So theoretically, he has the authority, theoretically, but that was how we went with it, was providing that, you know, this was the date that he was assigned um, to be the the base commander um, and that he has the authority as base commander to sign the AUL. Yeah, base commander's authority is pretty far reaching. The only trouble is they tend to rotate about every two years. So. Yeah. Right. Okay, that was a good question. Any Anybody else? Uh, okay, so Diane writes, is there a REBA title standard governing signatories for governmental aid entities? That's where I would look. So I think that's a good suggestion. And of course we would look there as well to land court guidelines as, as possibly a conservative approach to it as well. Um, my memory, I, I don't, uh, I have limited access to books right now. My memory is that there is not a REBA title standard regarding some of these government entities, but again, definitely we'll take a look at that. And thank you, Diane. 
What does Riva stand for? Diane, do you want to address it's the real estate? Uh, uh, real, real estate it's the Boston. Massachusetts Real Estate uh, um, Bar Association, I think. That's right. And they come up with um, sort of best practices, as it were, for their own members that uh, yeah. often are influential in matters like this. Well, and I think if you think about conveyancing, the most conveyancing is governed by REBIT title standards, usually by agreement of the parties, but that's, you know, where I would look for that. And you can get, find online at least if not the title standards itself, but the index of what's available for title standards. Because it also tells you how to correct things like Scrivener's errors and stuff like that. I'm not a real estate lawyer, so I, I, I'm not 100%, but I work with real estate lawyers. So I think that's where for documents to be recorded, I would look. You might not like the answer though, because it might be overly conservative. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, that's so. That's another thing. Which, I mean, I can just go ahead and mention that, which is um, those title standards generally govern the conveyance of, of property interests. Um, so, if we follow that, it's usually enough. Um, AULs are notices, and so we have to make a judgment, you know, as to whether a lesser standard is sufficient or not. Um, you know, uh, so I'll just I'll just leave it at that. Hey, any any other questions or follow up? Yes, Paul. Yes, Bill. Hi, Paul. And hey, everybody. I've been I've been really struggling with this word generated um, for the last week. And I'm in I'm in all the policies, and of course this would be an F what F001 waste, so it'd be um, chlorinated solvents. Um, it does exceed the um, S or the method one cleanup standard. So basically, we want to take it out of the ground and treat it ex situ um, at this property. And um, there's been discussions there. And my discussions and my training is that we can do this as long as we don't move it outside the area of contamination. They, they, that you guys talk about in your um, in your guidance, and and essentially what we want to do is remove it, treat it ex situ, and then take it off the property and uh, dispose of it as a non has. Um, am I am I close here? That's my education from way past. I mean, I think that sixteen hour uh, waste management course, uh, maybe fifteen years ago, even talked about this also that one can treat within the disposal site boundaries, I believe is the MCP terms, but also we can't really take this somewhere else that on that property that the concentrations are a lot less. So essentially you gotta be next to the, the hole, with, you gotta be next to the excavation treating it ex situ to basically meet this requirement of not generating. A corrective action management unit, CAMU, at the point of generation. Say it again, Matt. A corrective action management unit. I think it was called yep. a CAMU at the point of generation, Paul. Right. Yep. A CAMU. Yeah. CAMU. Yeah. CAMU. Yeah, the, the, the concept, are, and we do have you know, guidance uh, on, on this, and there's a training, and there's also the contained in guidance, which kind of keys in on, on a key, key point, uh, which is, you know, the general concept being that if you are treating it within the boundaries of the disposal site, within the CAMU, within the area of contamination, however you want to describe it, um, we have worked out with our you know, hazardous waste uh, colleagues over in the Bureau of Waste Prevention, no, Bureau of Air and Waste, them, they're called, uh, that you don't need a license for treating hazardous waste if you're treating it within the boundaries of the disposal site. So that's what that that gets you out of. You don't have to be a licensed hazardous waste uh, entity to do that. Uh, the, the rules kind of that go along with that is that you know it has to be within you know, the, the 21E site, within, within the area of contamination. 
because if you, you pull up hazardous waste and you bring it somewhere else and treat it there, you really should be licensed to do that. But if you're dealing with it on site as part of your remediation, then, and at that point you're not moving it off site, then, uh, then that's fine. Now, the kind of, I think one wrinkle of that is that uh, the hazardous waste program does have land disposal restrictions that would apply you know, if you generate the hazardous waste, so in this case, dig it up out of the ground and you're generating it, uh, you can treat it on site without a permit, but the land disposal restrictions might still apply, the kind of what you have to get to. Um, uh, so that, that's one thing that you have to keep in mind. Uh, but if you're treating it to, and you're eliminating its hazardous characteristics, and I, I think what you're dealing with what you may be dealing with there is um, you know, they, something can be hazardous waste because it's characteristic. So treating it, you remove the characteristic, the characteristic nature of it. Um, it's no longer a hazardous waste and then you can you know, manage it appropriately. Anything that is one of the listed wastes, uh, you can treat it to reduce the concentrations, but that treatment doesn't eliminate the fact that it's still a hazardous waste. As long as you're, you're getting detectable levels, then it's, it, it still meets the contained in criteria. It's still a listed waste. Uh, and at, at that point, uh, in order to move it off site as a non-hazardous waste, you would still need to get a contained in determination to kind of bless it and say, it's now the concentrations are low enough that it's no longer has to be managed as a hazardous waste. And that, and there's a policy for that uh, that also talks about the land disposal restrictions and that would, and the process for, for that happening. But can that treatment be above the ground or does it need to be below the plane of the ground? I, I, and I understood, and this is when you took it out of state, you know, they looked at those LDRs and if you treated it above the ground, they wanted chemical data on, LD, on all the LDRs. Yeah, well, that, that's, where, that's where the generation, not generation gets in. If you, if you pick it up out of the ground, then it's, it's generated. Uh, and at, at that point, you know, your, your best, kind of the, the LDRs would apply uh, unless you get it out of the hazardous waste system. It's no longer a hazardous waste. So there's the generation, not generation, uh, and that really keys into whether the LDRs apply. And then there's the, can you treat it with or without a license, which as long as you're doing it within the boundaries of the disposal site, you can do it without a license. Yeah, you might have to take it to like clean earth bill or something where they would do additional treatment and they might, might I think well, that's- I mean, the, yeah, this is gonna be kind of case specific on, on what the treatment is and what are the re resulting concentrations and kind of what, how it can be managed post-treatment. Kind of depends on what it looks like, really. But, there's, but if it's a listed waste, at a minimum, uh, even post-treatment, unless it's completely non-detect and you know, eliminated, uh, you would probably, you would still need a contained in determination to get it out of the hazardous waste management. I think that's how we got around it, Paul, or in the site that I worked on or something. So we treated it down to non-has levels, but we were able to transport it to, I think it was Phoenix at the time or something, and then they treated it down to non-detect and then it was able to be land disposed. Yeah. Some concatenation of treatment. Uh, Bill, you're, you're muted. Oh, you read my lips. Uh, Paul, so I may be splitting hairs here within the disposal site boundary. For example, I, for example, this uh, disposal site boundary is a small area in soils, and of course, it hits groundwater and then spreads out. So essentially, you're saying I could excavate that soil, but as long as I'm within the disposal site boundary, that includes both soil and groundwater. That is that 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 would be acceptable, or is my attitude was bring it to the surface and leave it next to the excavation of where you've removed it from and treat it there to be safe, you know? 
Yeah. So, so one thing to keep in mind is that you're you're, you're dealing with our, a couple sets of regulations here. So while we talk about within the boundaries of the disposal site, uh, within 21E, you also have to keep in mind, uh, as Matt had mentioned, the, the Camus um, and the areas of contamination as kind of defined and, and used in the hazard, not only the Massachusetts Hazardous Waste Program, but overlying everything here is the EPA Hazardous Waste Program. Uh, and so you you have to look at it in and look at that kind of treating it within the boundaries of a disposal site uh, through each of those lenses. And in order to kind of minimize anybody's disagreement about how that's interpreted, I, I would do just what you're saying. You you don't want to move it far because it it really is a question of, you know, do you need a license or not? At, at the point right. where you're treating it. And we've, we have had people um, uh, with kind of large sites, particularly where the site is defined by maybe the groundwater plume going and, you know, can you dig it up and move it several blocks away in order to <laughs> treat it at that location? And the, and the answer has been no, you know, that really doesn't <laughs> That, that might be part of the 21E disposal site, but the hazardous waste program would view that as taking it off site for treatment. So, you know, a little bit of common sense would, would go a long way there. Joe, so I stuck the link to the chat, right in the chat to the RECRA page, which if you scroll down has the camo with all the links. Yeah. Yeah, if you Google MassDEP contained in determination, uh, you can get that link. Um, and our Rose Knox, uh, who works in the Boston office in Wayside Cleanup, kind of is you know, manages that and reviews all the contained in determinations as they come in. And there, there is a 21 day presumptive approval for those, but Rose takes a look at them as they come in. And if you don't hear from her, then it's good. Good to go. Any other questions? And you know, if you can keep away from interpreting the hazardous waste program, I, I would be happier. Uh, other people's programs makes my head, head hurt. Especially the hazardous waste program. I want to ask you about Brownfields tax credits. Brad, again, other people's programs. Um, <laughs> I, no, I was just trying to be funny. I was really <laughs> asking. <laughs> I know. I was going to say the asbestos in soil. <laughs> so oh, like you're all comedians. Other people's all comedians. Comedians today. <laughs> What can we dig Paul with today? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, well so, yeah. you no, know, I don't know how many or EBC, but I saw in the EBC announcement, they were saying, hey, let's talk about anything other than PFAS or uh, you know, emerging contaminants. And one of them was microplastic. So I just wonder, is the department concerned about microplastic? Uh, I, I can say the Wayside Cleanup Program has not taken up microplastics yet. Sure. Yet. Uh, I, I do think our Office of Research and Standards is at least kind of following the issue and you know it, it's my guess it would be something more in the kind of solid waste and water programs um but um, um you know i i think i think that is probably more at a source reduction level kind of questions of how you can prevent them from being used and that's into the environment rather than how do you treat you know how do you manage landfills or manage incinerators or manage wastewater treatment plants to keep them from getting into the environment? Yeah, the, the concern, or at least some people's theoretical concern is we're not looking for them and they may be more widely spread air and otherwise they may be in all our soils and we're not looking for them, right? And well, I, we don't have methods to look for them. We don't have, right? Yeah, and, They're in the water. Wherever we do look for them, we find them and so yeah, I mean, add, 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 that complaint applies to a, a large number of other contaminants. Right. Uh, 
that that could apply and and kind of is a good good argument for kind of are you know what are the ways for treating things kind of more holistically rather than a contaminant by contaminant approach um because you end up you know you're only being concerned about the things you can measure and you have the anal analytical methods for and and the analytical piece you know doesn't necessarily keep up with what we should be concerned about you know, I don't know how much we should be concerned about microplastics, but given where where they're finding it in the water, you're, I'm glad people are asking that question. Any other nightmare scenarios we should we should be considering? No, no. Okay. Well, in in that case. Um, that's probably enough for today. Uh, let you be on your your way on a busy Thursday. Uh, gorgeous Thursday. Get outside. Look for those pileated woodpeckers.